like to talk something about two exercises in that is 13 and 18 because when it comes to students these need to be explained properly. So, OS 13 is about the situation where we have a throttling calorimeter and the situation is measure the state of wet steam that is mixture of water and steam x less than 1. So, here we know that the phase rule dictates that pressure and temperature are not independent of each other. So, we have to have one of them at most and something else. So, how do you determine the something else? It is difficult to do density measurement or it is difficult to do energy measurement. So, under certain conditions we use something called a throttling calorimeter. OS 22 is an illustration of throttling and separating calorimeter. So, you can extend this idea in uh, OS 22. Here the idea is like this, first the situation, suppose you have a duct through which steam flows and you measure its pressure say P 1 and temperature T 1 and you find that the pressure and temperature turn out to be lie exactly on the uh, saturation line. For example, the pressure could be if you look up the steam tables, pressure could be 2 bar and temperature turns out to be 120.2 degrees C or pressure turns out to be 5 bar, temperature turns out to be 151.9 degrees C. Such situations typically occur at the exit of a boiler steam generator just before it goes to the superheater or uh, some equipment which follows the boiler drum. But we want to know what is the state is and with such a situation the state could be anywhere from saturated liquid to dry saturated steam. The throttling calorimeter is a device by which we can determine the dryness fraction of steam under the following conditions. Number one, the pressure is higher than ambient. So, that if we take a sample of steam from this pipe and connect the other end of the sampling device to air, steam will start automatically flowing through it. We will have not have to use a vacuum pump or anything. And second, this works when the dryness fraction of steam is very near one within a few percent of 100 percent. It may not work when the dryness fraction is as low as 0 0.8 or 0 0.7, but it is likely to work when the dryness fraction is something like 0 0.94, 95, 96 and so on. So, what we do is the following. We take a sample out of this, maybe we put a tube with some holes and some steam a representative sample is taken out. Now, it is expected that P 1 is greater than P ambient. So, if this is connected on the other side to the environment, steam will start flowing through this and maybe a large amount of steam will flow. What we do, since we want only a sample, we put here what is known as a throttle valve a valve which is only partially open or sometimes a small orifice or a series of orifices. The job of this throttle valve is to provide enough flow resistance, so that even with the large pressure difference between P 1 and ambient, only a small amount of steam flows through this. Now, as it uh, reduces in pressure, the volume increases. So, we provide 
a large area for the steam to flow out. So, the inlet is here and we consider our open system to be made up of from the inlet to the sampling tube to the exit and at the exit we measure the pressure P 2 which is expected to be P ambient and we measure the temperature T 2. So, this is the inlet state I state 1, the exit state E state 2 and there is a small amount of m dot which flows through this. The whole thing is well insulated, it is not a very large piece of equipment. So, we expect that it runs in a steady state, there is no power output or power transfer, it is well insulated and because it is a small equipment delta E p is negligibly small and because of the small sample which is extracted and the large area which is provided at the exit, it is expected that delta E k is also negligibly small. If you start with the steady state energy equation, we get q dot minus w dot s is m dot h e minus h i which is h 2 minus h 1 here plus delta e k plus delta e p. Now, here q dot is 0, w dot s is 0, these two are expected to be negligible. So, we end up with the result that h 2 equals h 1. That means, from the inlet state to the exit state or for the inlet state and the exit state, what we have is the same enthalpy. And if you now look at the properties of steam, if you take it on say the PV diagram, let us say let this be the initial pressure P 1 inlet pressure and let this be the inlet state slightly wet. This is the saturated liquid line, this is the dry saturated vapor line and let this state be the inlet state. If you look up our enthalpy values, you will find that if I keep the enthalpy the same and if I reduce it to a lower pressure this line is likely to go like this and you will end up with a state 2 which is at pressure P 2, but which is likely to be superheated. And now, if you are in the uh, superheated zone, here P 2 and T 2 decide the state. So, from here we obtain H 2 and since 1 is wet steam, P 1 and T 1 is not a good pair. So, we use P 1 and then we use H 1 which from this relation turns out to be H 2. If you proceed with the details of this problem, you will find that in this particular case P 1 is 10 bar state of steam after throttling is 0.75 bar. So, they have used a vacuum pump or some such device to reduce the ambient pressure near the exit of the throttling calorimeter to 0.75 bar and T 2 is 100 degrees C. Now, from this 70.75 bar and 100 degrees C, if you go into our uh, steam tables, you will find that 75 degrees C is uh, 75 bar and 100 degrees C is tabulated on page 11, roughly slightly above the middle 
100 degrees C and 0.75 bar and here H2 turns out to be 2679.4 kilo joules per kilogram and hence H1 is also 2679.4 kilo joule per kilogram. Since P1 is already given to us as 10 bar, 10 bar and H1 of 2679.4 kilo joule per kilogram decides the state. And now we go to table 3, sorry table 2, page 8 where we notice the 10 bar line and if you notice that at 10 bar H f that is H f at 2 is 762.8 kilo joule per kilogram, H g at 2 is 2778.8. 1 kilo joule per kilogram and then you say H f 2 is less than H 1 is less than H g 2. Hence, H 1 lies between H f 1 and H g 1. Hence, state 1 is wet steam and once you decide it is wet steam, then X 1 can now be calculated as H 1 minus H F 1 divided by H G 1 minus H F 1, which you can calculate whatever value turns out to be. So, while explaining I have solved almost the, all the full problem for you. Now, another problem which I want to talk about is OS 18. OS 17 and OS 18 both pertain to what we call a heat exchanger. Now, we have to tell our students because when they learn this, they have not studied heat transfer. So, they do not know what a heat exchanger is. If you take them on a round of your campus, then you can show them heat exchangers of some times, which you will find in your central air conditioning plant or chiller plant and things like that or even open the bonnet of an old car, new car can also be used, but the uh, equipment is so compactly arranged and so cluttered in it that it is difficult to show the various subsystem. If you show them an old car, you can show them a radiator and uh, explain that it is a heat exchanger, but in a thermodynamics class all that you tell them is that heat exchanger is a is a open thermodynamic system. So, if this is a heat exchanger, there will be two streams flowing through it without mixing with each other. So, this is the transfer type of heat exchanger. Say fluid 1 rate m dot 1 enters at state 1 i and leaves at state 1 e. Fluid 2 m dot 2 enters at state 2 i and leaves at state 2 e. Tell them that look this is only a schematic, it is not necessary that the two fluids flow through two channels just next to each other as parallel lanes on a highway. They could cross each other, one tube could be rolled on to the other, they could be across each other, they could be against each other. There are types of arrangements, very complex ones in real life and, but what we should know is there are two streams not mixing with each other. So, what goes in at 1 i must come out at 1 e and what goes in at 2 i goes out at 2 e. So, this is an open system, two inlet, two exit, no mixing. It works in a steady state 
and although we claim it to be a heat exchanger, overall it is an adiabatic system, it is usually well insulated. And no attempt is made to extract any power. So, apart from q equal to 0, w dot s equals 0. Also, the change in kinetic energy for any stream is negligible, change in potential energy for any stream is also negligible. Now, if you look at our equation, the steady state equation is q dot minus w dot equal to, you will have m dot 1 h 1 exit minus h 1 inlet for one stream plus m dot 2 h 2 exit minus h 2 inlet. This will what will be the reduced form of the first law but we should derive it by the general form. On the left hand side, w dot is 0, w dot s is 0, q dot s is also negligible. So, you end up with this expression to be equal to 0, that is the heat exchanger equation. what happens inside the heat, inside the heat exchanger is there is an exchange of energy in the form of heat between the two fluids and because of that as you notice here since m dot 1 and m dot 2 are both positive the flow rates, one enthalpy difference will be positive, one enthalpy difference will be negative depending on which it is said to be the hotter fluid and which it is said to be the colder fluid or cooler fluid. And here we have to determine, for example, in OS 18, we are given 120 kg per hour of saturated water at 8 bar enters a heat exchanger and leaves at 4 bar 200 degrees C. So, in OS 18, stream 1 is water, 1 inlet is saturated water at 8 bar one exit is 4 bar 200 degrees c so there is a in the other side the other stream is hot air enters at 600 degrees c Six hundred degrees C two bar and leaves at two forty degrees C two bar. Two inlet is two bar six hundred degrees C and two exit is uh, two bar, so hardly any pressure difference on the air side, two forty degrees. So, now you will notice that you can determine H i H e for stream 1, you can determine H i H e for stream 2, m dot 1 is given, one twenty kg per hour. So, from this equation the only uh, unknown remains to be calculated is m dot 2, which you can now calculate. Heat transfer rate from air to water, remember here our system is the complete system, but you can devise another control volume and that control volume is containing only the one side through which say air flows. And if you want, you can have another control volume, control volume 1, 
is that part through which only the steam flows and you will have this q dot from 2 to 1 the rate of heat flow remember if we consider the whole heat exchanger as our system any internal heat transfer will not be computable so to determine the heat transfer rate from air to water we will have to put a boundary between air and water so we will consider either a green control volume which is the water flow control volume or the red control volume which is the air flow control volume and then when you apply your first law to this say to the water side you will get q dot 2 to 1 equals m dot into h 1 e into h 1 i and which you can from which you can calculate q dot the entropy production rate can also be calculated we have the expression just sum it up over two streams and b and you can proceed from there i think other exercises you can uh, tackle yourself 1100 mes pillai new panvel sir uh, we are talking about second law uh, about the degradation of energy you have not made any comment on that there is various ways in which the laws of thermodynamics particularly the second law can be interpreted okay i have left it at entropy uh, differences i have left it at the inequality which comes out of the second law the maximum i have done is defined entropy production and says any process which takes place is one in which entropy production is positive at most it could be zero in which case it will be a limiting ideal reversible process people interpret it as degradation of energy but uh, without defining what is meant by degradation of energy people uh, increase uh, interpret it as increase in randomness increase in chaotic behavior and things like that but we don't have to interpret it anything like that it's good enough for us to uh, interpret it as a change in entropy of adiabatic systems being always positive in real situations that's it over to you thank you very much over and out 1113 sb patil indapur uh, sir my question is how to derive the reduced equation of state for wonderwall gas Oh, how to derive the reduced equation of state okay in fluid mechanics we are used to using dimensionless numbers for example velocity uh, may can be made dimensionless by uh, dividing it by either the free stream velocity or the mean velocity in the duct we have reynolds number and all that okay so in thermodynamics when we compare different fluids and see whether their characteristics are similar we tend to use what are known as reduced variables so instead of pressure we uh, define pressure divided by some reference pressure temperature divided by some reference temperature and volume divided by some reference volume okay uh, for fluids which have a critical point and which is true for most of the fluids the critical state pressure temperature and volume at the critical state is used as the reference state so all that you do for deriving the uh, reduced form of the van der waals equation is write pressure as uh, critical pressure into reduced pressure pr temperature as critical temperature into reduced temperature tr and uh, specific volume as uh, critical specific volume vc multiplied by reduced specific volume vr now that way you will end up with an equation which contains the parameters a b and r as well as the critical constants vc tc and pc and we have already derived relations for pc vc and tc in terms of a b and r 
If you use those relations, you will notice that A, B and R get eliminated and the equation remains only in terms of P, C, V, C and T, C. That is the reduced equation of state or reduced form of the equation of state. Okay. The advantage is once this happens, once you are able to get the reduced form of equation without any P, C, without any uh, A, B or R in it then in principle you can use it for any van der Waals gas or any gas which obeys the van der Waals equation of state. Over to you. What is the significance of calculation of entropy in steam generation process? Calculation of entropy in steam generation process, I do not know, calculation of entropy and entropy differences is significant and good to look at in any process for that matter, nothing special about steam generator process. Actually, it is uh, the, the entropy comes into its own and it is very important when we have adiabatic systems, when uh, uh, like turbines, compressors, nozzles, sometimes even heat exchangers. Okay. Of course, steam generator is a heat exchanger, but we have a high temperature source from combustion. So, there is significant amount of heat transfer, significant temperature difference also. So, there will be significant uh, entropy production as we have defined the term. Apart from that, in the design of boilers, the entropy generation or anything is not used. I know that. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Over and out. 1272, Mangalayatan University, Beswa, Uttar Pradesh. Sir, yesterday we have just dragged on one uh, formula, TDS equal to DU plus PDV. Right. And I want to ask whether it is it is a uh, valid for closed system or open system or all the systems. See TDS this is a basic property relation. It is not for any process or anything. So, as a relation between properties of fluids, you can always use it. It has nothing to do with whether it is an open system or closed system. Now, if we are at it, I would like you to, you and all others who are listening to understand and appreciate this, because this quite often leads to some confusion. Now, consider for simplicity a closed system. Okay. And a, a small process. Now, in that small process we will have d q equals d e plus d w. Now, let us assume that d e equals d u. And let us assume that it is a simple compressible system. Now, in that case, I can write d q. Now, remember this is first law. d q equals d u. Now, simple compressible system, I can write this as p d v plus d w other, where d w other is other type of work say electrical or uh, uh, stirring or any other non uh, 2 w type of work. The only two way work is P D V because it is a simple compressible system. Now, this also is first law. Now, what does the second law say? The second law says that D S is greater than or equal to D Q by T. Okay. Since T is always positive, I can write D Q is less than or equal to d s. 
Now, that means I have combined this and this and I will get T d s is greater than or equal to d q and d q is d u plus p d v plus d w other. Now, for this equation I have used first law and I have used second law. Now, remember this equation, I will write it again on the top of the page, T d s is greater than or equal to, T d s is greater than or equal to d u plus p d v plus d w other and this is a consequence of first and second laws. Now, I will use the property relation. which we have derived yesterday. The property relation says T d s equals d u plus P d v and why can I use this? Because this is a property relation for a simple compressible system. Okay. So, now I have one equation which is an inequality for T d s after first and second law and another equation which is an equality for uh, uh, T d s using the property relation. And the, now, the next thing which I have to do is replace in this equation for T d s d u plus P d v and what do I get? I get d u plus P d v is greater than or equal to d u plus p d v plus d w other okay. and now d u plus p d v will cancel out from either side and I will get for a simple compressible system d w other is less than or equal to 0 for a And what does it mean? That means, if you have a fluid system like a liquid or a vapor or whatever, then if you do work, try to do work by a mode other than the PDV mode, because this is DW other, that work interaction will always be such that you can do work on the system, you cannot extract work from the system. And this is the thermodynamic consistent demonstration of the fact that you can put a stirrer in a fluid and start stirring it doing work on the system, but you cannot put a stirrer in a fluid which is already in equilibrium and ask the fluid stir the stirrer and do work on it. It cannot do that because the laws of thermodynamics prevent it. This is what we have shown. So, this is another justification that uh, work interactions which do not depend on any property of the material will be one way work interactions and this is the one way direction that is demonstrated by the laws of thermodynamics. Over to you. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Chikodi 1089 KLE College of Engineering and Technology. Over to you. Uh, actually, we want to know that how that a plug flow has been characterized, sir. Now, the energy of the exit plug will be equal to the mass in that plug, that is mass in that much volume multiply it by its specific energy. The specific energy for the inlet plug is E i, the specific energy for the exit plug is E e and if you go back a bit, you will see that the mass in the inlet plug is rho i a i v i delta t, the mass in the exit plug is rho e a e v e delta t. So, all that has been done is we have taken these two expressions and use those mass in the inlet plug and exit plug. Whatever you see in the brackets here is mass in the inlet plug 
what you see in the brackets here is mass in the exit plug and all that we have done is multiplied the mass in the inlet plug with the specific energy at inlet mass in the exit plug with specific energy at the exit over to you uh, as we know that uh, two temperatures were taken for the heat engine is there any concept of how the temperature distribution effect can be considered for the efficiency calculations the crucial thing here is to realize that it is the corollary of carnot which is more important that if you have two temperature levels then any reversible heat engine will have the same efficiency okay the beauty of this is this does not depend on any detail of how that reversible engine works so it has absolutely no relation with the temperature distribution from uh, t1 to t2 which may be occurring inside the engine we just don't have to worry about it that is the strength of carnot theorem and it is only on that strength that we can define a thermodynamic scale of temperature over to you if the water is heated hmm? uh, in infinite number of stages by bringing the water in contact with uh, infinite number of reservoirs hmm. uh, each succeeding reservoir being at a higher temperature than the next preceding one what will be the change in entropy of the universe okay this is i think an exercise either in uh, uh, sears book or the zivanski book you can show that as you increase the number of uh, reservoirs each uh, increasing by smaller and smaller delta t the you can show that the change in entropy of the universe Uh, reduces from a large positive number it will come to a small positive number but for it to reach zero you will have to make the number of reservoirs really to infinite any finite number will have a small but finite entropy production making the process irreversible but your idea is right that is what we will need but you will need an infinitely large number of reservoirs even reservoirs differing by 1 degree centigrade will not do 0.1 degree centigrade will not do you say 10 raised to minus 9 degree centigrade even that will not do because that is still a positive temperature difference over to you why we ignore the pressure variation with elevation for a storage tank in a gas the if the density of the gas is not very large then compared to the mean pressure the pressure variation will be small and since the pressure variation is small the variation in other properties also like is also likely to be small so the results which you obtain regarding what happens to the gas and the way it behaves will not significantly differ if you replace that varying pressure by a mean pressure at an appropriate value the purpose of doing all these approximations is not to say that that doesn't matter but to say that the variation may be of some consequence but if i neglect that and base all my calculations on the mean uh, pressure the results which i obtain are good enough to do all the things which are needed to be done for example the gas drain rate or the gas heating rate or whatever but there will be situations where perhaps you will have to consider that variation in which case there is no choice you can't neglect that over to you yes is it possible to attain to zero zero temperature zero kelvin temperature experimentally no because if you attain and create a system at zero kelvin then that means you can run a reversible 2t heat engine between some other temperature say ambient and zero kelvin and that will have an efficiency of 100% so that itself will violate the kelvin planck statement so zero kelvin is a uh, temperature which we can write down on paper we can discuss it in a workshop like this but which will not be attained uh, can we call that entropy will measure the irreversibility not entropy entropy produced or entropy production is a measure of irreversibility and next week when we considered combined first and second laws 
we will be studying what is traditionally called uh, exergy analysis or availability analysis, where we, where we will provide some uh, significance to the quantitative or the numerical value of entropy production. Today, we can only say that any real process is one in which the entropy production has to be positive. In the limit, it can be 0, but that would be an ideal reversible process and we are unlikely to be able to execute such a process in practice. But what is the difference between a process in which the entropy production is say uh, 1 kilojoule per Kelvin and another in which it is say 2 kilojoules per Kelvin that we will be able to realize only after studying the combined first and second laws next Wednesday. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Over and all. 1150, Godavat Institutions, Atigre. Over to you. Sir, my question is, what is the value of dryness fraction at critical point? Okay, see dryness fraction is defined only when there is a distinction between the liquid phase and the vapor phase, so that density of liquid and density of vapor have two distinct values uh, and so are other properties. At the critical point, there is no distinction between the liquid phase and the vapor phase. That is the lowest pressure at which it occurs. Since there is no distinction in the liquid phase and vapor phase, there is no meaning in defining a dryness fraction at the critical point. Over to you. Sir, can we measure the entropy? Uh, by measure, you mean a direct measurement of entropy, then the answer is no. Entropy or entropy difference between two states can always be derived, but cannot be measured. Similarly, uh, even energy difference between two states can always be derived, but it cannot be directly measured. So, as we are having statics and dynamics in engineering mechanics, hmm. like that, uh, is there the study like thermostatics, as we are staying, uh, saying thermostatic valve, and uh, what about thermostatics, sir, the study of engineering branch, is there? Okay, actually, since we have, we lay significant emphasis on uh, equilibrium, maybe things pertaining to equilibrium states that is property relations etcetera, you could consider as thermostatics in our course. Whereas, change of state relation between uh, processes, interactions uh, and uh, end states that can be considered thermodynamics. And if you want to bring it the time rate by considering some other extraneous properties like uh, conductivity and all that. In that case, perhaps the science of heat transfer, which we will be studying or students will be studying slightly later, that also could be included in the so called thermodynamics. Over to you. Sir, yesterday it was a discussion. Can we say the opposite word of sublimation as the throttling? Because uh, during rain, we will get the ice blocks, and uh, that is the instantaneous process. And also in a jet plane where air particles are converted directly into the ice particles, is it uh, so with this opposite word of sublimation is throttling, is it right sir? No, throttling is an entirely different phenomena. Throttling is a simple fluid dynamical process in which in a small zone like a capillary tube or a small orifice or a slightly opened valve, the resistance to flow is so large that even a small amount of flow requires a large amount of pressure drop. That is all. Throttling, the effect of throttling is to be calculated thermodynamically as we have done in one of those exercises and you will realize that it has nothing to do with the sublimation process. In uh, solid state physics and uh, in uh, material science, sublimation has an opposite, but they use the same word condensation. So, they say that uh, carbon dioxide vapor condenses directly into solid carbon dioxide. So, technically the word condensation can be used to uh, denote a liquid of a vapor as well as the solid of a vapor. Whereas, a liquid becomes solid, it is called freezing. 
gas becoming liquid is known as condensation. In a similar fashion, gas becoming solid is also known as condensation. Over to you. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, when we are defining the temperature in the textbook, we will see, see the meaning. It is a degree of hotness or coldness. But when we are defining to the electronic level, uh, for example, when we are defining the current, we are saying that uh, charge transfer from one electro electron to another electron. Then how we can define this temperature with respect to the atom level, considering the electronics and the kinetic energy, like that, sir? Okay. In our scheme of thermodynamics. Temperature was only the a label given to isotherm. Labels given to various isotherms were defined as temperature. We later on quantified it using the second law of thermodynamics, Carnot theorem, etc., etc. If you want to give a different interpretation to temperature, you will have to go through kinetic theory, where uh, kinetic theory derives relations where uh, for a conglomeration of particles which we in the continuum domain say behave like a gas, you can derive an equation of state where you can show that the volume multiplied by the uh, mean momentum of the particles equals some constant into the mean kinetic energy of the particle. Okay? And then we compare this with the our equation of state from macroscopic thermodynamics and say that look this is very similar to P V equals R T provided we assume that P represents the average momentum of particles and T represents the average kinetic energy of the particles. So, that is one way you can interpret temperature as kinetic energy of particles. Actually, even kinetic theory does not really say that temperature is the uh, mean kinetic energy of particles. You can say temperature can be used to represent the kinetic energy of particles. That means, for a given set of particles, if they are in a state where, where they have a higher kinetic energy, they will have a higher temperature if measured on the macroscopic scales and vice versa. Over to you. Uh, sir, while we are uh, considering the plasma state of steam or water, is it the ideal state we can, uh, can we say that plasma state of water is the ideal state? No, there is, see there is no such, no state as an ideal state. An ideal thing is something for us to define. Ideal gas, we call it an ideal gas because we want to call it an ideal gas. The gas does not itself know that it is ideal or otherwise. And for a uh, fluid like water, there is no such thing as an ideal state. We can only have a reference state, that is it. And even the reference state is for us to derive, define. Over to you. Uh, sir, for the turbine and the compressor, E raise it is decreasing and uh, increasing. We are finding out the efficiency. Now, you are giving the example of the duct. How you derived the efficiency for the duct? No, there is no such thing as an efficiency for the duct. The idea of isentropic efficiency is only for three components, a nozzle, a turbine and a compressor, that is it. For no other thing, something like an isentropic efficiency is defined. And remember that that isentropic efficiency is something which we define. Thermodynamics ends by telling you that entropy for such an adiabatic system should be such, entropy change will be such that at the exit, it will be higher than that at the inlet, except in the limiting case, in which case it will be equal. That is where thermodynamic stops. After that, it is for us to define using those ideas. Over to you. Thank you very much. Center 1001, MANIT Bhopal, over to you. Sir, yesterday you were discussing the property relations. Yes. In that uh, you have discussed Helmholtz function and Gibbs function. Right. So, first thing, what is the significance of these two functions? And second one is, can you give some examples in the real life where we find these actually functions? Okay. Uh, the utility of these functions is mainly from the point of view of thermodynamics and particularly of physical chemistry. They have been defined because they have been found useful. The simplest example of this is 
enthalpy has been defined because it has been found useful and we have that u plus p v term coming up quite often particularly when we have open thermodynamic system. Actually there is nothing wrong if the whole world decides to forget about enthalpy and works only about only with u and p v. But then every time we will have to we will not tabulate enthalpy, but we will have to work with u and p v. In a similar fashion the two functions Helmholtz function a and Gibbs function g have been derived because they have been found useful in doing detailed thermodynamic calculations and calculations in physical chemistry. Uh, we are not spending much time on property relations. In fact, uh, given to given the choice, I would spend another 5 to 6 hours with my students on property relations demonstrating to them what is the utility of A. All part or a hint in uh, property relation exercises, yes the last two exercises PR 20 and PR 21. The look, if you look up PR 20, uh, it asks you to demonstrate that if the Helmholtz function or specific Helmholtz function of a system is specified as a function of temperature and volume, then all properties including any change of phase saturation lines can be derived. And in fact, this is the way our uh, steam tables are specified. If you go to the link provided on the Moodle page through the NIST steam tables, you will find that the specification of properties of steam is only in terms of one single function A as a function of T and V. From there everything else is defined or derived including uh, critical point, liquid vapor saturation point, from triple point onwards everything else including specific heats can be extracted out of it. That is the power of the Helmholtz function. But in our day to day calculations, we do not come across that so often. Gibbs function is useful because we have showed yesterday that the uh, work which we can extract from a system which executes a process which is isobaric cum isothermal would be limited or the maximum work which we can extract will be the decrease in the Gibbs function. So, this is the this is related to the chemical potential of uh, a reacting mixture. In fact, if you st uh, uh, study physical chemistry, you will soon be made to realize that uh, chemical potential is nothing but uh, a specific Gibbs function uh, with respect to the change in one particular component, what is known as the partial moral, uh, molar Gibbs function that is the chemical potential. Okay. So, chemical equilibria, rates of reaction, all those things they depend on Gibbs function. Since we are not delving any deep into combustion and chemical reactions, uh, we will not be appreciating the importance of Gibbs function in this series of lectures. However, it is my duty to expose you that there is something called Gibbs function which we should be aware of. Over to you. Okay, thank you sir, over and out. NIT Nagpur 1128, over to you. Time is the parameter in steady flow energy equation like uh, Q dot term is joule per second. Then how thermodynamics differs from subject heat transfer? Okay, see here you will notice that uh, this first law of thermodynamics is derived just by differentiating the first law with time. Q dot is still related only to energy changes or energy change rates and work rates. It is not related to any temperature difference or temperature gradient. It is the job of the science of heat transfer to relate the difference in temperatures to the rate at which heat is transferred. For example, yesterday we solved a problem, I think the very first exercise is the second law. It says there is a 150 watt of steady heat flow from one system to another. Thermodynamics does not tell you how that 150 watt is uh, arranged. That is the job of heat transfer. Over to you. Uh, can you tell me the difference between ideal gases and perfect gases? Uh, I do not really know because uh, when I was in school, the idea of ideal gas and the idea of perfect gas was the same. 
Some textbooks called it ideal gas, some textbooks particularly in physical chemistry used to call it a perfect gas. So, in physical chemistry you have a perfect solution and a perfect crystal. So, maybe they like the word perfect. Later on I found that some textbook define an ideal gas the way we do and then what we call or what I have been calling ideal gas with constant specific heats they tend to define as a perfect gas. So, there is no global definition. I get a feeling ideal gas is a more common nomenclature and if you want to use a perfect gas to mean something else or the same thing, say so and use it, that is it. Unfortunately, the uh, scientific community has not standardized nomenclatures and symbols except a few things like uh, pressure, velocity, internal energy, entropy and enthalpy. Even availability, exergy, these are not standardized. Over to you. 1118 Sri Jaya Cham Rajendra College, Mysore. When you say open system and control volume are same, can we consider control volume area to be a closed system? If so, how both open system and control volume are similar? See, open system and control volume are synonyms. They can be applied to any system through which a material can flow in or flow out, particularly a fluid, but it could be any other material. If during a process some mass flows in or mass flows out or both, we call it either a control volume or an open system. The traditional method was control mass and control volume. The modern method is closed system and open system. I think that should explain it. By the way, I have been frantically uh, been informed that tea is ready and we have to break. So